Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our midweek service here at the Family Worship Center. We miss you, but we are glad we can come to you via the uh, web, the internet, whatever you uh, younger people call it. We're glad that we can come out to you, and I thank God for that. We want to go, um, I'm going to give a couple of reports. Uh, Brother Smith is doing a much, much better. Uh, for those of you who knew that he was in the hospital, he, uh, uh, last week he was really, really sick. And they even, they even didn't know what it was, and they said he's probably got COVID pneumonia, but it turned out it wasn't that at all. Praise God, it was a, it was a congestive heart failure, fluid building up around his heart and his lungs. And I saw him Monday, and they were getting that off. Over the weekend, he could barely talk. He had no energy. But Monday, he was talking, and we had a great visit. And today, he was doing even better. Probably be home by the weekend. That's what the doctors are thinking. And so, I want to give you the praise report for him, because he was pretty sick last weekend. There's a lot of people out there. This COVID is making its way through our land again, through our cities and schools and everything. So we want to pray that God will, will touch that, bring us through this. And I believe he will. I, I believe he will. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, somebody said, oh, are you scared of it? No, I'm not scared of it. I'm, I'm not hiding from it. I'm not going to go out and engage it. I'm not going to go out and grab a hold of it. But I'm not going to uh, just quit. I, I have to keep on keeping on. And, and the Lord will make a way. And I hope I never get it. I haven't had it so far. So I hope I never do. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing. Father God, tonight as we come to you, we give you praise and honor and glory. We love you, Lord, from the depth of our soul. We're so grateful, Lord, for all of the blessings that you've given to each and every one of us. We thank you, God, for touching Brother Smith and, and restoring him and, and lifting him up one more time. We're believing you, Lord, for him and Sister Smith for a complete recovery, for Brother and Sister Vaughn, God, for a recovery in their lives as well, God. And all of the others, God, that are facing illnesses and uh, different things throughout our land. We pray, God, for this COVID virus, God, that it will become extinct. Lord, that you will curse it, you will cause it to die, and we will get back to some form of normality. God, we pray for our churches. We pray that you'll bless them. pray that you'll bless the service tonight, Father. I'll give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Reading tonight out of the 34th chapter of the book of of uh, Exodus, after Moses has been receiving his second tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, and we come down to the uh, the thirty, the seventh verse, where we see that before the Lord passes before Moses, and he and, and Moses is actually in his presence. So in the seventh verse, he says this: He's keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the, on the fathers, upon the children, and upon the children's children, unto the third and the fourth generation. Now, what we see there is something called the generational curse. Tonight I want to talk about the generational curse just a little bit, but I also want to talk about the generational blessing, and I think as we're getting ready to start this new year, we're still early into it. Today is... Uh, I'm not, I don't even know what day it is. Let me see, 9, 10, 11, 12, be about the 12th. Uh, so we've got a, a third of the month gone. And uh, so it's still a good time to say, you know what? In 2022, I'm going to make it the best year of my life. And I'm going to put out generational blessings instead of generational cursings. Now, just remember that. And um, so we've heard a lot of talk about generational curses uh, over the years. And, and, uh, what just exactly what that means, I, I got a good idea, but I won't say exactly that where the sins of the father are passed down upon the children from uh, second, third, and even fourth generations. And, uh, but yet, before that, he's talking about his ability to forgive. And so if, if God will forgive, uh, these generational curses can come to an end. If somebody comes along and they're in the second generation of uh, of a really bad lifestyle, and God comes along and they, they ask God for forgiveness and they straighten up their life, then they can go back and, and start over again and bring an end to that generational curse. And um, so uh, just as well as in, in the Old Testament, the generational curses, there's, there's something of that today too. And, uh, but God, along with uh, Christ 
sacrifice on Calvary, as somebody will come and, and get forgiveness for their sin, that curse doesn't have to continue. So I'm going to say that right now. Don't accept just because maybe there has been bad things happening in the generation before you, the generation before that, it doesn't have to continue in the generation that you're in. You can stop it. You can break the chain reaction. And you can start a new generation and to begin to live brand new. Now I've seen, I've seen through the years several generation curses and, and uh, how that they would go from one generation to another. And the reason it would is because the choices the people that lived in those generations made. They, they, they did stay from one generation to another to another. For example, maybe the dad was an alcoholic. The son comes along, starts bringing his dad at an early age. He becomes an alcoholic. The, the great-grandchildren come along and start bring, And so all of a sudden, you've got two or three, and even however long this type of lifestyle wants to go on, it is because the people choose to stay in that lifestyle. And uh, there's a saying called uh, monkey see, monkey do. I, you might have heard of that over the years. In other words, you, you, a monkey sees somebody do something, he will mimic it. He will do the same thing. Well, you know, people do that too. People do that too. And uh, so the lifestyle that we exhibit before our children may very well stick with them. My dear old daddy, I loved him. And uh, the man, he laid down some bad examples for me. And I was doing pretty good at following along the way he lived. I, I talked like he talked. I thought like he thought. I did, did some things that I shouldn't have done because I seen my daddy do it. But I just want to stop right there and give a report. I believe before my daddy died, he got saved. I believe he got saved. Give his heart to the Lord. I'm looking forward to seeing him in heaven someday. But, but it, the way that you live as a parent or an example, whatever you may be, the way that you live that example, somebody's watching you and they're following you, and if they, if they look up to you, they're more than likely going to follow your example. Amen. So when we say that uh, they may follow in your footsteps, well, you've got to consider where do your footsteps lead. There is a beautiful story, and I, anytime I'm talking about this, I have to, have to share it. Uh, it. It's an old story. It took place back in the, uh, probably the 1800s in, in England. And there was this, uh, you can picture the English streets there and the apartment and the houses and the walking down the street as everybody did in those days. The dad every day would get up, put his overcoat on and walk to work and he'd walk to work and every day he would stop by the pub, uh, beer joint in our language. He would stop by the pub and get him something to drink on the way to work. This was something he did just every day. And uh, so one day, his little boy said, Daddy, I want to go with you to work. And he said, no, son, not, not today, maybe some other time. But it just happened to be snowing that day. And it was, snow was deep enough to leave some pretty good footprints in the snow. And that morning, the fellow got out of his house. He walked down the street into the pub and was standing there drinking a beer. All of a sudden, he felt a little tug upon his coat. And he turned around and he looked and he saw his little boy. He said, son... How did you get here? How did you know where I was? He said, well, that was easy, Dad. I just saw your footsteps, and I was following in your footsteps. And that touched that man. And he picked that little boy up, and he turned around, and he went, walked out of that bar, that pub, and he went back home, and he put his little boy at home, and he never again walked into that bar. It made such an impression on him. He said, I don't want my son following in those type of footsteps. Amen. And uh, there's, there's a lot of people today that do the same thing. They're, they're, they uh, may be a person who just rejects God or just really don't have time for God. They're not mean towards God. They're not angry towards the God. They just, God is, well, God's over there. If you want him, fine. If you don't, fine. He really doesn't mean too much to me. And this is the lifestyle that they live before their children. They may be living in an immoral lifestyle. They may be living with somebody outside of the bonds of marriage. That's so common today, and people don't think anything of it. Well, friend, i got to tell you, it's still sin, it's still wrong, and God wants you to quit it. If you're living that lifestyle, God doesn't hate you. He's not going to de destroy you because of it, maybe. But he wants you to quit it because it's wrong. If you're living with somebody and you're not married, then get married. If you love them that much, then get married. Well, anyway, there's people that do that today, and their kids see it. Uh, there, there's people that may be involved in drugs or alcohol, 
that, that's a part of their life, and, and then, then their kids see that. So what do you expect your kids, what kind of choices do you expect your kids to make when they get to that age to where they're not old enough legally to do it, but just big enough? Isn't it amazing how people don't wait till they get to be 21 to start drinking beer? They don't, they don't wait till they get to be a certain age before they start doing things that they shouldn't do with immorality. Isn't that amazing? They've seen it. They've seen it, it has become a pattern to them, and they, and they follow along with it. And in some cases, they're signing a death certificate, possibly for one of their children. You know, I, I, I use this example quite a bit because I know there's some people that drink, and listen, I'm not coming down on you. I love you. I, I'm not mad at you. Uh, but you shouldn't be doing it. You just shouldn't be doing it. Well, it doesn't hurt me. I only have a beer once in a while or, you know, when we go out to eat and, and uh, there may be a glass of wine or a, at the Mexican restaurant, maybe a margarita. Yeah, maybe a margarita. They look so cool. Well, it's alcohol and God has something to say about alcohol in the Bible. He said, I'll just sum up this. Someday I'll preach on that, but it's just not wise. It's not wise at all. And it brings a lot of trouble. It brings a lot of destruction. And I don't have time tonight to get into all that, but just analyze. Think about, think about the car accidents, the, the spouse beatings, the children neglect, all of the things that goes along with alcohol. And Paul tells us to shun the very appearance of evil. It's not too much more evil than that. But yet, you may be able to handle it. You may be able to drink a beer every now and then. And you, you lay it down, you don't have to have it. But you know that child that sees you, he may come along and he may pick it up and he may have an addictive nature. And all of a sudden, he, he can't put it down. She can't put it down. They can't stop. And all of a sudden, it becomes a part of their life. And they have started the second wave of the generational curse because it becomes a curse to them and it becomes a destruction in their life. And uh, there they go because of the example that they've seen. So that's how generational curses start. And unless somebody comes along and stops it, yeah, that's where it's gonna, gonna go. And there's the people that, uh, who live a hypocritical lifestyle. They, they go to church. Man, they, they're their church uh, every Sunday morning. They just, that, that's what they do. They go to church every Sunday morning, but, but their kids at home see something totally different than a Christian lifestyle. They see the parents using language they shouldn't use, and the kids say, well, I didn't think we were supposed to talk like that. They see them doing things, watching things, going places that they shouldn't go, and the kids say, I didn't know we were, I thought we weren't supposed to do those things. So they're seeing a profession of Christianity in one way, but they're seeing a, a totally different wave in another way, and that's called a hypocrite. And I'm sorry, I, I can't, I can't, make it any easier than that because that's what it is and the kids they're going to make a choice on that do i want to be like mom and dad do i want to be that kind of a christian or do i want to be a sold out christian or do i not want to be a christian at all if that's all there is to it amen you know you you can fool some of the people some of the time with your christianity but those who live with you and they see you day after day you're not going to be able to fool them and it makes an impact in their life. Amen. And then there's the guy that, uh, like I say, he's, he's not against God. Take it or leave it. But he knows he should have his kids in church, so he puts them in the car and he takes them to Sunday school every, every Sunday morning, and maybe he just does that so him and the wife can have an hour or two that they, they got a free babysitter. Well, that's okay. We'll babysit them. You bring them to us. We'd love to babysit them. And on Wednesday night, we have our youth service, our children's service. Again, they'll just load them in the car and bring them and drop them off and even come back and pick them up. Well, thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Amen. But you know, we really ought to go one step further than that. If that's all they ever see, then the next generation, and I see, I've seen it happen. We've been here for 32 years, going on our 32nd year, and I've seen generations do that. I've seen kids grow up in our youth programs, and then they, they quit coming at a certain age. And then I'll get a call from them, you know, in five or six years, and they've got kids. And, hey, are y'all still running the uh, Wednesday night service? Yeah, yeah. Well, we want our kids to be there because we were there. Well, I, I hope somewhere along the line we, we run across a generation that doesn't want to just stop when they get to be 16 or 18 years old, but they say, you know what? I found something that's real in my life, and I want to stay with it. And so we see that. 
I, I knew a guy one time, he said, you know what, I was, I was raised in church. My, my dad made me go to church. I'm not going to make my kids go to church. I'm going to let them choose. I'm going to let them make their own choice. So I'm going to, if they want to go, fine. If they don't, fine. I don't care. I'm not going to influence them either way. Well, most of the time, without godly influence from parents to encourage kids to go to church, they're not going to go. So therefore, you haven't really given them a choice. You have given them the choice that they, they go to uh, school because they have to, and they hear the teachings at school and the, all the people and everybody at school, but they never get the influence from church and, and preaching and worshiping because you haven't brought them there. You haven't brought them there. And uh, so a lot of times uh, people say, I'm just going to let them make their own choices. Well, let me, let me give you a, a little example here. If you're not going to take them to church or make sure they're in church, then wh why bother to uh, send them to school? Why don't you ask them if they want to go to school or not? If they don't, say, okay, you don't have to go to school. Take a bath. I don't want to take a bath. Then don't take a bath. Brush their teeth. No, I'm not going to brush my teeth and change their clothes uh, come in at a decent time of night, uh, respect people, uh, get a job, someday grow up, get their own house, their own family. If you let them choose on these things, more likely, as long as they've got food on their table and a roof over their head, they're going to choose the easy way out, and they're going to live not according to godly standards, but they're going to live according to the standards of the world. And if those are the choices you made, this is what you might wind up with. You may have children that uh, are lazy, Dirty, foul-mouthed, disrespectful, addicted to drugs, run with the wrong crowd, won't work, steal to support their habit, live in a pig pen, don't go to church, and wants nothing to do with God. And then you call the pastor and say, my children are out of hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll do what we can. We will, we'll never turn them away. But it would have been a whole lot better if you would have started years ago. If being in church and connecting them to God would have been something you did on a daily basis and a weekly basis, and it would just become a part of your life. But we see these generational curses pass from generation to generation to generation because of uh, bad lifestyles, bad choices. Amen. And uh, kids go in the wrong direction. But you know, just because they go in the wrong direction doesn't mean they have to stay in the wrong direction. And just let me say this, I know there's some godly parents out there that are in church all the time, and you serve the Lord faithfully, and, but yet your child grows up and they go the wrong direction. Now listen, don't blame yourself for that. You've done what you could do. I mean, we're all human beings, we're all going to make our choices, we're all going to choose to do what we want to do, and so yeah, there's going to be some kids that are raised in church under Christian homes, and they're going to choose the wrong way. But you know what? You've planted seeds in, into their life that's going to be there forever. That hopefully, they'll bring them back. I'll give you an example of a person that uh, raised their son in, in church, and, and uh, he went off. His name was uh, Franklin Graham. You know who Franklin Graham's dad was? Franklin Graham's dad was Billy Graham, the, one of the probably the greatest evangelists America has ever known. But he got to a certain age and he went out and started living a wild life, doing drugs and all nine yards. And he walked away from God for several years. But there were seeds that had been planted in his heart and in his life growing up that made an impact. One day God found him, the prodigal son, found him down in the pig pen and brought him back home. And Franklin Graham's today has got one of the greatest ministries in the world called Samaritan's Purse. He preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ feeds the hungry, and takes care of people. Why? Because there were seeds that were planted by godly parents. So godly parents, if your child is veered off, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. The Holy Spirit knows where they are, and, and the Holy Spirit can find them and bring them home. And I, probably most parents have one child or two or three that may be out there, and they're not where they should be. Don't ever give up. If you raised them right and you planted seeds in their heart, don't give up. That's, that's not generational curses there. That's individuals choosing to do their own thing. Amen. Charles Spurgeon had a, a label that he laid on the, labeled on the Holy Spirit. And he said, the Holy Spirit is like the hound of heaven. That old hound dog that goes out through the woods at night barking and chasing. And he'll find that, that animal or whatever it might be. And he'll find it. And that's what Spurgeon said about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
will go after the lost person and he'll find him and put that conviction on their heart. Well, there are generational curses and I, I uh, understand that and uh, I don't want to be a part of a generational curse. I would rather be a part of the generational blessing. You see, we get to choose what we want to do. God, God speaks uh, to Moses in Deuteronomy 13. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. If you choose life, you're putting blessing on your children. If you choose a godly way of living, you're putting a blessing on your child. They may go away, but you've been sowing seeds into their heart, and I don't believe they'll ever outrun the Holy Spirit. They may be 30, 40, 50 years old, but I believe the Holy Spirit can get a hold of them and bring them back. Amen. Then it goes on to say this. This is what you choose, that uh, you choose life, that both you and your seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey His voice, and that thou mayest cleave to Him or cling to Him, for he is thy life and the length of your days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers. And here comes a generational blessing that he swore to his father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, God put a generational blessing on Israel. And many times people walk away from it. But the seeds are still there. And one day God's going to bring that nation home. Amen. And so I believe in the generational blessings. I love what it says in Proverbs 22 and verse 6. I'm sure you know this verse. You've heard it over and over again. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Amen. I want to just, um, well, let me get back to that in just a minute. When I got saved, there wasn't anybody in my immediate family serving God. And, and the boy, all of a sudden, man, I, I got saved. I was on fire for God. I didn't want anything but God. And the Holy Spirit burned in my heart and in my soul. I wanted my entire family to get back in church if they were backslidden. To, I wanted the ones that weren't saved to get in church and, and find God. And I'd witness to them. And it didn't seem like it was making a lot of results, but I did see some of them come in. Like I said, my dear old daddy, who was anything but a Christian as I was growing up, been hit in the latter part of his life, my daddy would sit down and read the Bible. He would talk about the Bible. He would go to church with me. And I just believe that somewhere in all of that, he found Christ. Amen. And that's a kind of a reverse generational blessing. I was raised up in the wrong generation, but I stopped it. And I turned it around. And I began to bring back that which was lost. My daddy and my mom and my sister, they, they, weren't, they weren't going to church that time. I don't want to say they're backslidden, but they weren't going to church. And they got back into church. And my brother... I lived with him shortly after I got out of high school. I lived in his home. And my, brother's, my brother, in my, in my opinion, is a great man. He's a great man, a hard worker, just a good man. But he wasn't a Christian, and he wouldn't go to church. But he was raised in church as a little boy. And, uh, you know, sometimes we want him to come back at a certain age. My brother died when he was 62 years old of multiple myeloma bone cancer. And I stood beside his bed just a short time before he passed away. He said, Dan, he said, I want to tell you something. Me and the Lord got it all worked out. You don't have to worry about me anymore. Thank God. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the generational seeds that were planted years before, before may have took 50 years, 60 years to, or 50, 55 years to take root and begin to grow. But when it come time that death was knocking on his door, he knew that he needed Jesus. Now, he had an opportunity. Everybody doesn't. But there's people who die all the time and don't have an opportunity to cry out to God. Killed instantly in a car wreck. Fall over dead from a heart attack just like that. Doing perfectly fine. Bam, dead two seconds later. So don't depend on that. Don't depend on that. But make up your mind. You're going to do what's right. Amen. And uh, I like what Joshua said. And this has been my... my uh, Goal, been my teaching, been my thought and way of life. Joshua 24, verse 15 said this. As he looked around him and he saw wickedness going on in the nation. And Joshua was kind of the leader. And he looked around and he saw people doing their own things. He asked him this question. He said, now if you want to go back and live the life that your fathers did before the flood, live in sin, in other words, idolatry, 
You can choose to do that. But I'm going to choose to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You choose what you want to do, but it doesn't matter what you choose. I know what I'm going to choose. So don't look around you waiting for somebody else to get saved. Don't look around you waiting for somebody else to get on fire for God and somebody else. You know what? We've been playing church. We've been playing with God, going when it's convenient, not going when we don't. You know, make up your mind. You're going to get in with God like you've never got in before. And you stand right in the middle of this world and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will be known as Christians. We will be a light that shines in a dark place. Amen. Set, set, your, set your goal, set your standard that right now you're going to start a new way of life. Amen. The Bible teaches us how to do this. Amen. It says, serve the Lord with your whole heart. Not a part-time deal. Show your children the right way with your words, but also with your actions. Get in the car, children. Why? Because we are going to church. Thank you for sending them to church, but come along with them. Amen. The Bible says if you love your children, you will discipline them. We, we need some discipline in this world today. Kids grow up and they live bad lives sometimes because parents are afraid to discipline their children. God said this one. Teach them the way of the Bible. Don't just carry that Bible. Say, this is our Bible. Open it up and read it to them. Begin to explain to them. Get, when they're babies, when they're little, get them a big picture Bible book. Instead of all the comic books, maybe that's fine. But you sit down with that Bible and you begin to explain to them the pictures and the things of that Bible. Amen. Praise God. Somebody in the congregation's got their phone going off. Would you please squish it? Thank you very much. And uh, it, I guess it'll go out here in a minute. But teach them the ways of the Bible. Teach them how to be young men and women. Did you know that's what God made us? He made us man or woman. There's no third choice. That's what you are. Teach them how to be good, respectful men that love their wives, that are, that are there for their families. Teach the women how to love their husbands and love their children and put together a good, godly family. How are they going to do that? Because they've seen it in your life. Amen. Be that one that starts that generational blessing that passed down from one generation to another. Amen. Teach them that work won't kill them. Amen. It'll put food on their table. Put a roof over their head, clothes on their back. Amen. Work will not kill them. So teach them that. Amen. Be their parent, but also be their friend. Now, be their parent first. Amen. It, I know some, some people have taken the idea that they're just going to be a friend to their child and they're not going to have the upper hand on their decision. Well, no, you're still mom. You're still dad. You have the right to lead them and direct them, but be it a, a friendly. Let them know that they can come to you anytime with their problems, their situation, and you'll be there for them. Amen. Here's some things I want you to do for your children. Help them. Understand them. You know, we don't understand our kids. Well, look back a couple of, a couple of decades, and you were in their shoes, so understand them. Respect them. They have, they have the right to have their own choices. Amen. Show them appreciation. Amen. Matthew 7, 12 says, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You want your children to respect you? You respect your children. Teach them that. Give them a vision. Amen. T tell them that they can. Don't put them down, but build them up. Amen. Show interest in what is important to them. Make them feel important. Amen. And you can add along with that all of the love that you can muster up into their lives. You love them with everything you got when they're two days old, and you love them with everything you got when they're 50 years old. There's never a time that you quit being a parent. You'll always be a parent to that child till you die. Amen. And you make sure that you pour out the love into that. My mom, when she was in the nursing home, she like 90. 92 years old, and she still had some motherly instincts. I'd go over and see her just about every morning. Did that for about three years. She'd be eating breakfast, and she'd say, you want something to eat, Danny? Like she's going to get up out of that chair and run into the kitchen and fix me something to eat. Why? Because that's a motherly instinct. You never be quit becoming a parent, a mom or a dad. You'll always be there. Amen. So get real, real serious about your generational blessings as we start this year. Amen. 
tell the devil he can't have your kids. It doesn't matter what everybody else has done. But 1 John 4 and 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, Jesus in our heart. As God has got you in his hands, you have more power than what Satan does. So don't just lay down. Don't let Satan have his way. Rise up against him. Rebuke him. Cast him out. And make sure that your children are led and pointed in the right ways of God. Amen. Because Satan's not just fighting you. He's fighting Christ as well. And the blood of Jesus that flows from Calvary's hill will cover it. Amen. And Satan cannot cross that bloodline. Amen. Now your kids will still have to make their own choices, but I believe that what you, the way you raise them, the way that you, things you teach them, the life that you've lived before them will be a great influence on helping them to make decisions. And uh, several years ago, my goodness, Joe and Jeremy were still in school. And I sat down on a pile of sheetrock in Las Vegas, Nevada, one day where we lived, and a guy working with me said, uh, do you really think that your boys are never going to grow up to do anything wrong? I said, well, I don't know. I hope not. I'm just going to hope not. But you know what? I believe that if they do, they've got enough respect for me, they won't let me know it. Because they know what's right, and they know what's wrong. And you know what? They did. They did. And now they're both good, healthy men. Not, they're not young men anymore. My goodness. 47 and 50 uh, 51 years old. Amen. They still love their mom and dad. We still get together. We've still got a great family because we poured love into their hearts, into their lives. We poured godly principles into their hearts and into their lives. And they know it. They know it. Praise God. So you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. Amen. And I believe everything you can do will help them to make the right decisions. And I believe your prayers will commission the Holy Spirit to find them if they drift away, to find them wherever they may be, and to bring them back home. Love is the greatest gift that you can give your children or give to anyone, and uh, it's a gift that God gave to us. It's a gift that God gives. Yeah, there are generational curses. I choose not to go that route. I choose to go in the right of generational blessings. Doesn't matter what your life was yesterday or where you came from. You can start a new one right now today. Amen. Praise God. Love you. I'm glad you were with me tonight. And uh, getting ready to close out here tonight, I want you to invite you uh, this uh, uh, Thursday night. We'll have our CFI meeting. Come out and be a part of that. And uh, just enjoy the fellowship and the Bible teaching and the visiting and uh, the banana bread and coffee and juice. And uh, then see you Sunday morning, 9 o'clock for Donuts, 9.30 Sunday School, and 10.30 for morning worship. And we'll see you then. And God bless you. We love you. Amen.